right, thanks everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started then. Yeah. All right. Good morning from Houston and welcome. Uh, we're just about to get the uh, get the video started on our end. Uh oh, we've got <laughs> some permission. So you just have to hear my mysterious voice uh, while while we get that set up. But welcome. I'm Jason Oliver. I am the regional ambassador for the US South with art and feminism based here in Houston. I'm really glad that we're that we're doing the celebration. I see we have quite a few people online with us, and then we have a group of people here with us in person, and we'll have folks cycling in throughout the day. So it's really, it's really exciting. This um, focus on collective action is, is really important. So I'm so glad as somebody who does a lot of local organizing here in Houston, um, that we're having this global conversation, that we're really talking about accessibility, uh, which is especially important for a city like Houston, where we have uh, so many people from various backgrounds uh, that speak different languages that are that are here with us. So I really, really appreciate um, that we have all of you here with us. And I'm going to also quickly uh, highlight, so we'll, in the afternoon, there will be various workshops alongside the Wikipedia editing that's happening. So please stay engaged with us throughout the day. I'm really excited for our keynote that we'll have. Uh, and, and if you have questions, please feel free, feel free to ask, but welcome on behalf of, of all of us in Houston, and thank you for, for joining us. I'll pass it to Kira, who will uh, share a little bit more about our keynote speaker. Well, actually, first, we're going to go to a quick hello from, uh, from the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. Sorry about the, you can't see us right now here in Houston. We're working on it. All right, we'll come back to this, but hi, you can hear my voice. Uh, my name is Kira Wisniewski. My pronouns are she and her, and I have the distinct honor and privilege of being uh, the executive director here at Art and Feminism. Um, I want to quickly thank Jason and everyone who helped organize today and help us be here. Jude, I'm trying to make eye contact with you. Thank you for your help today. <laughs> um, and I want to welcome everyone who's joining us in person and online. Um, and we have a couple people who are joining us uh, from a satellite event in Ghana right now. Oh, actually, our video is ready. So let's go over to Mariana. Hello. I'm the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. I wish I could be with you today in person. I'm actually on a plane flying back to Texas. I just wanted to take an opportunity to say congratulations to Art and Feminism on this 10-year uh, milestone and also to all of the allies and friends, foundation staff, others that are there celebrating and marking this moment. I've learned so much from Art and Feminism in the year or so that I've been with Wikimedia. The power of the collective that they believe so strongly in the way they've thought about their values. And it's just really a privilege to be able to add my voice today and say congratulations. Thanks, Mariana. In our ongoing equity work, it is both exciting and important to us to feature conversations that are not centered in English or in the US. Today's keynote conversation brings together five incredible individuals working and living in Latin America. Their conversation will focus on their experiences and research work as curators and museologists, bringing feminist and decolonial perspectives to contemporary art and memory public institutions. 
please help me welcome Paula, Mariana, Maria, Lorena, and Liliana to our virtual stage. Hola. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, we're not being able to turn on our cameras. I, I, I've already sent a note, so whenever we can turn them on, please let us know, and that way we can see each other and we can introduce ourselves differently. But I'm going to start moving forward, and I'm going to talk to you about who's here on this panel today. First, moderating this conversation with me, Mariana Fossati, who is Uruwasha, sociologist, activist, and visual artist. Currently, she's a coordinator of the program Decolonizing Wikipedia of the Uznodich Project. I don't know, Maria, if you want to say hello. Yes, hi. It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this panel and of the celebration. So I'm thrilled to be here. Next. Another one of our panelists first is Liliana Angulo. She's an artist of African descent from Colombia. She graduated from the National University of Columbia and she has an MFA from the University of Illinois in Chicago. She's worked in different regions, regions of the African diaspora, including contributing to the communities of African descent, utilizing collective strategies and a critical artist practice. She explores memory and power through themes of representation, identity, race discourses, and development. She has individual and collective expositions in Colombia and internationally. Currently, she works as co-curator of the Afro Museum in Colombia. Welcome, Liliana. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Wonderful. Now it's Lorena Luengas. I shall present her. She's a museologist and visual artist, PhD student in artistic studies at the Universidad Distrital of Colombia. She has many processes in the museum and cultural with emphasis on curatorship, research and exhibition management. She has formulated and implemented non-formal education processes with expertise and she has worked in social organization historical memory memory initiatives in her country currently she is she works at the afro museum in colombia welcome hi good morning everyone i'm thrilled to be here it's so exciting i think this is so interesting wonderful and lastly our last guest is mario eugenia vidal maru she's Technician in Museology and Specialist in Cultural Management at the University of the Republic of Uruguay. For the last almost two decades, she has been working with different organizations and institutions, both public and private, with impact in the artistic, social, and educational environment in Uruguay. She was general coordinator of the contemporary art space between 2010 and 2020. And since to th uh, December of 2020, she is a coordinator of the SUPTE Center of Expositions in Montevideo. Welcome, Maru. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to especially uh, thank you all to inviting me to be a part of the celebration. Wonderful, thank you all. And lastly, I'll introduce myself. I am Paula. And after being, uh, aside from being staff from, I'm also ambassador for Latin America for art and feminism, and I'm also thrilled to be a part of the celebration. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to Mariana. Thank you, Paula, for the introductions. I am gonna start sharing some questions 
uh, for this conversation. The idea is for this to be more of a conversation, a dialogue, rather than a presentation from each one of us. So I'm going to be sharing my questions, and then we're going to be going around so that we can answer them. And I will ask Kira and the team to help us to keep track of the time, please, because we have really interesting topics to talk about with these curators and artists and museologists who are fascinating people. So uh, we can probably talk about this for a really long time. And there's also several of us. So uh, just help us out uh, to staying conscious of the time. And if you can be letting us know how much time we have left, that'd be great. So I'm gonna start with the first question for each one of you all. We wanted to ask you if you could, we could start this chat sharing a process in which you have worked on or are currently working on that you see as a challenge regarding the changing of narratives in museums and exhibition spaces, especially in Latin America and its specific contexts, nationally, re regionally, thinking especially that there's a whole series of questions currently from feminism, from the perspectives, anti-racist and anti-colonial perspectives towards the cultural institutions uh, the traditional cultural institutions. And we are interested in seeing how these questions are perceived from within, how the institutions are transformed, how you work in institutions that are sensitive or uh, okay with being questioned. And we think that what would be ideal is for you to share these ideas of a concrete challenge of a, a project or a job in which you have been participating from your own institutions. So we're going to go in the order that we started, and I'm going to start with Liliana. So yes, this is really interesting. And myself as an artist, I've been working with Afro-descendant populations in Colombia and in the diaspora and in Latin America and other places. And my experience, let's say, in the case of museums and spaces, we really see that there, there's not much representation of Afro people if we're talking about collections or archives and our own shows and expos. And yeah, Black women are not represented. And a lot of the processes that I've developed are about that. Oh, I think I can now turn on my camera. Great. Awesome. Great. So yeah, a lot of what I've done as an artist is related to that really challenging the absence or that were not represented, the Afro, the African artists or Afro artists are not represented. And that we need to be represented in Colombian art and in these spaces. And I could talk about many processes, but perhaps we can talk about Right now, Lorena and I find ourselves in this large challenge. And right now we're working on a project and we are wanting to create an Afro museum here in the country. And this is very challenging because we live in a centralist state 
racist, patriarchal, that makes it so that that makes it and it makes it hard, makes it challenging. And it's challenging because the majority of the Afro population in Colombia is in different regions, in the Caribbean, in the islands. And we have, and they're located in the Colombian territories, in different zones, in different areas, different locations. And they they are needing their basic needs met and have a hard time getting access to things even such as internet and for us it's a challenge and for this to be transformed for us to accomplish what indigenous people and afro people are are wanting we need to really talk about the narratives and build them from our own perspectives and not from from any other perspectives that is not our own and so that people are able to have access to be there to be represented as artists and for there to be gender equity and have projects that are anti-racist and also be respected in the way that we build culture and the way that people and community think. And I would say that currently, that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing. And as artists, we're seeing a lot of gaps and even violence that we have experienced as artists with the different institutions. So I would also add that. Thank you so much, Liliana, and I'm going to pass it over to Lorena so we can continue to talk about this and this process that you all are working on with the Afro Museo. Yes, I can definitely talk about that. And yeah, that's our challenge currently. It's it's a big challenge and really the we're trying to create this process that breaks these paradigms that is not rooted in the definitions of what is, a mu what is a museum, but that it can be built from thinking around what are the needs of the people who are part of where we are. So we need to ask our people, what do they want from this space? What do they want it to look like? And there's already been interesting things that have been happening and how we can, do this research in a way that's not just to create re representation, but we're seeing really there's this historical debt as it relates to rep representation and people, Black people here in Colombia didn't start with enslavement. There's different histories. What are those histories? And in the different regions of the country, we don't know all of the history. And we always have to think about, oh, well, don't, don't forget that you were once enslaved and that's how you arrived here. But no, tell me about the other things. Who are we? What do we represent? And I also wanted to share something that's happened that's been beautiful. I've been part of this process and there's always different programs that come about when you're trying to create things such as this, like communications programs or things like that. But there's this really awesome focus on education. We want this to be a space that acknowledges 
the people and I'll I'll wrap it up soon because I don't want to speak too long. But it's really we want to talk about what do I want to share? What do we want to share? How do I build my story? How do I build history? How do I convey who I am? But also, how do I relate to others? Because part of the reason for segregation is the lack of knowledge around practices, around culture. And really, this is a process that requires research and participation. And Liliana is going to share. And it's hard, and but it's possible. It's possible to have this this collaboration and this collectivity and we're on it and but it's a challenge yeah that's super super interesting Liliana and Lorena and yeah we were really thinking that or we're hearing about the challenges and we wanted to just hear more from you all and we're going to pass it over to Maru and She's currently working in a public institution at Uruguay, and she's had so many years of work that she's done, and especially around the paradigm shifts. And we definitely want to hear from you, Maru, about the challenges that you faced. Thank you so much, Mariana. Yeah, going off of what my comrades were saying, and really coming from this understanding that art is experience and we have been working on projects that that allow us not only to work from the gender perspective but also to be able to transform and i wanted to highlight the word project instead of topics because you know social media is full of topics or headlines but really we want to be able to generate projects that are research-based and that do this work and I want to share briefly about two projects that we began from Subte, one in 2021 and one in 22 and 21 we invited the Coco Collective. This is a feminist collective that's made up of three artists, Natalia de Leon, Maria, and Catalina Bunge, to name them. And we were in mid-pandemic. All the different centers and museums were closed. And so we invited this collective so that we could take control of our social media from our institution. We found all our passwords from Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook so that this collective through our communications channels could share about their research from a feminist perspective and help build the story of art in Uruguay and how they represented with women and other gender identities. So the Coco Collective shared through our media channels about the lack of presence of women and talking about the representation that we've been seeing nationally, the awards that people had been receiving. And it was really an experience that was so transformative. And then I, I also wanted to share, if I have another minute, about the experience that we had last year, where we also worked with a collective. This time it was the Ruido Collective, who are visual communication students. And we invited them to talk about and to organize some workshops and have some public workshops. And we had some that were really close to the center of the city. And the idea was for them to create posters and signs that shared tools, knowledge for us to be able to 
put on these posters and put graphics and drawings and words so that we could take it to the action on March 8th and for us to be able to share the information that we needed to share with people. And Liliana were, was there with us and now we see each other once again. And these, these posters that women created in these workshops were taken to the marches and then they were part of an exhibition and I wanted to share about these two experiences because these are two projects that not only want to go against the authority, but also have such a deep political consciousness to them. And I also wanted to share that as it relates to the question. Thank you so much, Maru. And yeah, it's really awesome to be able to be in this virtual space again. And moving a little bit into the digital aspect of things, I wanted to ask, how do you integrate di digital frameworks into the work of your organizations? And what opportunities, challenges, opportunities or challenges can you identify right now in online spaces and digital spaces that allow artists from historically marginalized collectives to become more visible? so that people can be amplified and be more visible? And how can you strengthen and strengthen the work? So I wanted to leave you all with this question. And see how you can answer this. And I'm going to start with Maru since she was already talking about this work that Coco Collective was working on. Well, digital culture and the current way that we relate, you know, are part, are part of, it's, it's not our, not just our aesthetic, but it's also the way that we relate and it has a lot to do with our artistic practices. And for us to be generating proposals and projects that are centering these things, you know, social media are not only specific channels, but these are ways that we can share the different aspects of the work that we're doing. And this question also relates a lot to access and audience and Uruguay currently, there's a lot of youth that are using TikTok. And if we're interested in reaching those audiences, the youth, we need to start using those communication channels, not just to produce for those channels and utilize those channels, but really to be able to reach our audience and to reach them in this visual way. Thank you so much, Maru. I will hand the mic over to Lorena. Well, there are several challenges that we have as a team. We are a very large team. Well, there's 10 of us in the research we call it a, a museum and curatorial research we are formulating at the same time the, at the museum and what is going to be at that museum we have a huge challenge here why because colombia has really places that are really far apart or far away that are very isolated and they're also isolated digitally and there aren't always resources to be there. So we would say some of the things that we have talked about is that it's necessary to start 
establishing communications that can be direct, that can be heard between us and those communities, especially because Black people and Paniquera people, there it's it's very diverse. There's not just one way of being. There are many ways of being. So we think that uh, participation. We, we've already done a first series of being in territories. We were in 26 municipalities. We did 36 local groups, workshops, collaboration processes of co-creation. In this moment, we have a process in Quito. But we can't really say that you're part participating if people spoke up once, they were heard once, if there isn't a relationship. So the digital part is the way in which we'll be able to have conversations that are a lot longer, respectful in the way that not, I, I don't know, I not only ask you, but I start building and I start showing you and you can tell me, no, this should be a little to the right. I don't like this term here, whatnot. So one of the things that we believe in and we're developing is the development of the digital part of the project, web page, information channels. We are building some stories for YouTube where people can tell where they've been, who they are, what they uh, what language they speak and we're trying to upload those to the web page that we've already developed it hasn't been that easy because i think that you have to give these spaces a uh, mobility you can't stand still and to build them we have to have uh, dialogue capacity like to be able to answer so there's two big challenges one that has to do with formulating that space of participation also digitally, but on the other side, how are we gonna reach those territories where even digitally, it's really far away? So there's that double action and I'll hand it, I'll leave it to Liliana to finish building it, but I think that's a big challenge and I wanna center it. And I think there's really interesting experiences of co-creation digitally. And I think we're gonna have to stick to those a little bit. I'll hand the word over to Liliana. Yes, thank you so much. The, the digital gap in Colombia is huge. There's a lot of territories. There's, there was a scandal last year because there was a corruption case with resources that were to place internet in rural areas so people in rural areas could access. So in Colombia, it makes it really hard to really feel that the digital part might be a possibility that's tangible. In that moment, it's not. It's especially in urban centers where we find access to internet. And that gap also has to do with different things that intersect. So access uh, for older people, for people uh, that don't have as much education, lot, lots of things that we have to take into consideration. And at the Afro Museum, we have proposed from the curatorship some possibilities about the digital presence that allow us to, to take certain topics to the territories. And that's something that we have to work on knowing all these things, knowing that only a percentage of the population that accesses the museum digitally will have that possibility. However, there is some experiences that we have had to connect different locations so that that allows us, especially with the Afro theme, 
the, a lot of the information about the Afro communities and about the Black people that came to the Colombian territory. They are in museums, archives, in other parts of the world. So to be able to connect these archives digitally will allow us to amplify the possibilities of the collection. That's one of the possibilities that we are proposing. And also, as far as territories, as Lorena mentioned at the beginning, there's a strong interest for the museum to be a tool, an educational tool, and, and that will be allowed through digital tools, especially educators, people that dedicate themselves to teaching. There's a lot of possibilities that exist as far as self-education, it's a topic that's been really interesting for us to talk about, to, for them to have these digital tools to access content, even if they are not uh, in the physical side of the museum. But there are a lot of challenges and a lot of possibilities that maybe throughout time, they can be de developed as that digital gap lessens. Thank you so much, Liliana. I think that's so relevant to bring the perspective of the digital gap, the many digital gaps, territory, race, it perpetuates colonial patterns. And I connected with this that you were saying about the, the, and the collections that are spread in different institutions that started appropriating patrimonies, memories, uh, from the Black and Indigenous cultures in Latin America and at the North, Global North and Europe and United States, the same national capitals in our, in our Latin American countries have done the same with the rural territories and the Indigenous territories. But I don't want to uh, keep moving on too much. I would like to hand the word over to Paula to share a round of reflections, and then we'll start closing closing out uh, today's participation round. Thank you, Marianne. As we know, Art and Femorism celebrates its 10th anniversary during this event, and the general subject for this meeting, both virtual and in person in Houston, is collective action. And during this year, and in this event in particular, we are reflecting on how the communities have taken advantage of their collective power to face inequality and uh, the, the privatization of rights. I would like to ask the four of you, what does collective action mean to you? And I'll hand the mic uh, back to Mariana. All right. Collective action, I think, is a crucial part of social life. There's no social change without collective action, without people that are living through the conflict and the inequality and the many dimensions of oppression. And, and of the many powers and privileges that are causing this oppression. If there's no people questioning it, living this, there's no social change. And the only action is a collective action. Latin America has a long tradition of, of collective action movement from the indigenous towns uh, to students. in the uh, university movements, for example, uh, the worker movements, et cetera. There's a whole constellation that speaks about social change uh, during, uh, as with conflict, questioning. And I think art and feminism has been a project that throughout the years hasn't sil silenced, hasn't been, hasn't, hasn't erased these fights. On the contrary, it's amplified them and it's made them visible. And I'm hoping that this continues and we continue 10 years and then more 
for this visibilization of collective action. Thank you, Marianne. Liliana, if you would like to mention, uh, talk about what does collective action mean to you within the Afro Museum? Let's say the collective action or collective work is one of the ways of living and of relating with the territory and with the world of the Afro communities in Colombia and also with indigenous communities. It's a, it's a completely different paradigm because for communities, all, all work is collective. There's no, and not an individual way of thinking in way it, life is lived here and live it, life in general. That has been used in, against the communities as far as land ownership, because there never was a thought about having property titles for one person. It's, it's a territory and it's a collective. So that, that has been used against these communities for, uh, for stealing lands and in different processes like these. And one of the biggest strengths of the communities uh, about the development idea, that's why we talk about development, how can we think about this capitalist logic of development in a different way? And it's something that communities have always had. The idea for life, it's there are concepts that for us at the Afro Museum, they're crucial because it's the same way in which the communities operate and the way that they see the world. So in that sense, me as an artist from some time ago, a lot of the processes that I develop are collective. I, and, in, and it's a very large question uh, from the art. How, do, how does one do that? How do we work collectively? How do we build collectively? And that is part of what motivates the action of what's being done at the Afro Museum to change that uh, individualist paradigm. Thank you so much, Liliana. Maru, would you like to go next? Yes. Adding a little bit to all of this, everything that's been said, collective action is crucial for museum work to work collectively with the social fabric. It's the only way of, of placing the the questions that are relevant politically and socially, it's to prof profoundly related the museum with the collective and always taking into consideration communication and ideology. And that's what has to be there permanently. This dialogue that we are building all of us together right now, I think that it's crucial to generate sustainable spaces of confrontation, of reflection, and above all of work, to work in a collective way, to broaden a way of thinking, always working with others, change curatorships, to not close ourselves, not to not close ourselves to other ways of being. There's always uh, ways of learning from other people. And I think that's the, that's the path. That's the path for growing and for transforming the future. Wonderful. Lastly, I would like to hand the uh, mic over to Lorena. I think that, I think there's two things. On one side, it's the voice. How one, and I was thinking that collective action is a motor, it's,
And we must have mechanisms of building and collaboration. So when we think about being in the middle, sometimes we are, and it's a big responsibility. And there are many things that can go wrong. And also, we can have the ability to open up these different channels and find things in common. How are other people saying this? And really finding commonalities, finding the ourselves being uncomfortable. And sometimes they might tell you, okay, like let's build this paperwork or let's do this paperwork in this way. But sometimes it's hard to collaborate and creating these bridges for us to bring our voices and to feel represented. It's definitely a responsibility to allow and build. And this is also, I would say the metaphor is the river. It can rain and it can overfill and overflow and it's beautiful. And being able to have the tools for, for us to find the way and be part of this river. And how Liliana was saying, I started to build this relationship and these connections with people. And you can't do this alone. You can't be isolated. And it's such a big responsibility, but it's also a privilege, the privilege to be in these spaces, to be able to listen, to be able to, to also be a platform to support the folks who are sharing and create things that become other things. And that's where we see this this piece and that's what I would share like that's where it happens yeah great and the la the last thing that I wanted to add is that art and feminism is an international campaign but also focused on the local context and it has the goals of connecting collaborating and creating visibility for artists that have been marginalized and to break the status quo within Wikipedia of who, and really asking who are the artists of each region of each country. And it also has the objective of informational literacy. So people who visit museums can also find information about these artists or the movements, the artist movements, the art collectives, and be able to find them online and also contribute to, continue to better the information that is available out there. And just how art and feminism has these goals and these objectives and we work year after year I feel so proud to be able to be part of this organization and the organization that Mariana participates in is working on Wikipedia and Wikimedia to just better the access that is available because right now we are not visible but we want to be and we are making it so. And just to close, I wanted to thank you all for allowing us to have this conversation and answering these questions. And I'm not sure if there are questions from the audience currently. And if there aren't any questions, I'll pass it over to Kira. And we can keep moving forward. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you. Ooh.
thank you so much for that conversation. It was really, really lovely uh, to have you all join us. Thank you for sharing. There's so many gems of wisdom that you're sharing with us. So thank you. Our, we do have a couple of minutes if there are any questions, either in the room in Houston or virtually. Oh. But no pressure if not. No, no, no. Okay. Um, we just want to thank you all again for joining us today. We have a lot of exciting things happening both here in Houston and also online. We hope that you'll stay and join us uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, we also will be opening up the editing room soon and we have some exciting lists available in English and Spanish, hopefully to do some uh, community editing today. And we really just want to thank all of our speakers again today. Thank you all for also bearing through a couple of technical difficulties, um, but glad that we worked it out and uh, we will close it out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good luck in everything that you do.